42 on the Lackawanna cutoff. We're going to be interviewing Thomas Townsend Tabor. Tom Tabor. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh, and I'm president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association. And we're here in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and we're going to be talking to Tom Tabor. Now, many of you may be familiar with Tom Tabor, and many of you may not. And you'll find out what his relationship is to the Lackawanna Railroad, and to some extent to the Lackawanna Cutoff. So, off we go to meet with Mr. Tabor, and you'll find out the significance of his background and his family background for the Lackawanna Railroad. Hi, well, we're with Mr. Tabor, Thomas Townsend Tabor III, Tom Tabor, um, the author of the compendium on the Lackawanna Railroad. It's three volumes. Uh, I wrote, in effect, one of them. It was originally to be two books, the 19th century and the 20th century. But I added, because my father he died, and I added the equivalent additional information. That's why volume three is uh, why my name is in it. But for the first two books, uh, my father wrote it all. Now you, but you actually published the books. Yes. You published them. Did you publish them yourself? Because I see. Yes. That. Okay. Look, oh look, yeah. Com uh, like Homing or like Humming, is it? Printing company. Printing they printed company. it here in Williamsport. I was his. For one year, I was his biggest customer. Of, uh, so, but that's see, you know. You, did you run out of space? Because I know in one, I think it's in the third volume, um, you, you talk about there being uh, not enough space to, to thank all the men who would, uh, who were the Lackawanna men who had been um, friends of your father. Yes. Um, uh, I was that, did, do you literally yeah, no. didn't happen to Rome or what, what, was, what was behind what that? What I did, and I'm a person if somebody else does it, I don't. I do what others do not do. And I had, uh, let's see, so uh, I'm a maverick and um, not conventional because most people only tell you what they want to hear, and if they're a lawyer, they'll distort it to uh, give emphasis to their side and not give a, a complete thing because they're, but that's the way it is with lawyers. They always have an ulterior motive. So you know, uh, what you're saying is that your father, uh, and, and, and I think it's in the prologue to the first book, it says that your, your father basically put together, he had all the documents and, and put oh, together. Yes. He collected information. And he knew. He started. He, when did he, he was 12 years, no, when he got his postcard camera. He was 13 or 14. What, what year would that have been, roughly? 19, 12 or 13. Okay. He lived in Montclair. He grew up in Montclair. And, um, but later in Madison, right? Well, somehow I think I um, uh, associate him with Madison, but he, you're saying he, he grew up in Montclair, though. Yeah. Well, uh, Madison is after he got married. Oh, I see. Okay. Madison, New Jersey, if yeah. we're talking. Yeah. yeah. 
in Montclair, New Jersey. But he grew up in in uh, Montclair, and that was at the uh, terminal there as a teenager. And that's when that was just built, wasn't it? That, that yeah. Because the terminal that they uh, elevated and got it's in there. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Yes. Uh, in fact, I could probably find it while you're talking. But the, um, but suffice to say, well, he, if he would remember the um, the days in which uh, the the Montclair branch, for example, was. Um, the original, and then they were re rebuilt with the six tracks. I think it's six tracks. Later, cut down to, uh, I think currently, there's only one or two tracks in Montclair. And it doesn't, doesn't it stop doesn't, there. It doesn't stop it. Yeah, Montclair is, you, you continue on with the uh, Erie Railroad. They talked about that for many years of connecting the two. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I, don't know, I, I heard something like since the 1920s and the 1930s that they had talked about connecting the two. It took until 1990. Trying to think when that exactly took place, late 90s, I want to say, or 2000, that they actually made that physical, the so called Montclair connection. Um, question for you, um, or maybe about your dad, because your, your, your dad um, really grew up. Would you have considered him a rail fan, or what, or, or was, because he was an advocate as well? He wasn't just the, the person who went. He progressed beyond. Being a rail fan, after he re retired um, on disability, he was 62, and that's 1962, 61, and uh, he he had a detached retina, a very serious one, and he had to disability, which <laughs> resulted in increasing, he told me, his pension. He retired on disability rather than on um, age, because uh -huh. he one year, one or two years, but he knew all the, he knew all the railroaders, and uh, so did I. When I was, I got, of course, the hobby from him, which is very few father and sons do what I did. And I, uh, going home from high school, uh, I was. Fourteen. That's nineteen thirteen. Uh, yeah. And I taking a shortcut, and there was a local freight, the drill as we called it, in Green and Pearson, and I wanted to get to know these. Men, five of them, and how do I do it? Because I don't, can't memorize. I talk with the conductor, and uh, who was acting as a flagman at a crossing, um, and I thought of uh, collecting autographs and I got a notebook and had every Lackawanna man who I had any contact with I'd ask him 
was autographed job, and I have 150 of them. Uh, and I have them, they're in the, my stuff down in Strasburg, 100, 150 names, of, and everybody, Port Morris, I wanted to ride the, the last four four rows, and that's what I wanted for my birthday. Uh, I asked my father, he called up Perry Shoemaker who lived in the summit, and said, it was the easiest birthday present he ever gave me. He just said, yeah. And so I uh, <clears throat> took the 970, no, 988, uh, which the, was the one that had the wings on it, but the wings had been taken off in the war. And, uh, that's how. So you got to ride in the cab with some memory. So. 150 autographs of all these Lackawanna men, and of course that any kid uh, is highly unusual. I'm the only one who ever did it, and uh, that I know of. What what's what's your earliest memory? Now you what you did. So you, you would have grown up then in Madison yourself, though. He, he yeah. grew up in Montclair, but you... Yeah. What's your... Do you, do you have an earliest recollection? The first time you rode a train or first time you... Do you, uh, what, what, you know, what kind of strikes you, if you can recall? I, uh, well, it, it goes back to when I was probably four years old. He had a of training. He, oh, um, and, uh, I got it, that hobby from him, but I amplified it with all these. Uh, I kept them there in Strasbourg, the box, with all the signatures of the railroad men by conductor, brakeman, station agent, uh, engineer, train master. Nobody, no other kid ever did that. They took pictures, but uh, it was always different. Now, did you, I, 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 I want to say, and I'm, I'm quoting out of your book, I'm trying to recall now, but um, I got the impression that you got to be a fireman at least. Did you ever get to fire? Oh, <laughs> is that true? Uh, yeah. You know, um, we a, uh, a steam locomotive. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was in, in 1988, and coming out of uh, Washington on the return, I wanted see about firing it. Well, you're going along at 50 miles an hour <laughs> and uh, the first shovel full of coal was intended for the firebox and hit the back head and went all over the floor. Okay. It's not as easy as it looks, right? <laughs> then the second shovel full of coal did the same thing again, and the third shovel full of coal, with that I quit. It's, it's, it, you know, your railroads have lost 90% of their regular business. They dumped it. Now they're, of course, running three mile long trains which 
you get stuck at a grade crossing, and you got a three mile long serpent going along at 30 miles an hour or whatever speed they run at. So, and of course, the rail fans are out taking pictures. They, uh, uh, well, let me ask you about this because the insurance, uh, you know, the insurance stuff nowadays really makes it difficult, if not impossible, for somebody to, let's say, ride in a cab. Like, uh, but in, in those days, there were still insurance regulations. Like, if uh, they were running a, a um, a rail yeah, fan yeah. safari, and you had a, a, a gondola you had, car. You well, you had rail fans, trips, um, and you used your the insurance for the regular passenger trains. You so you were covered by the the, the yeah, when the, the uh, sure. okay. when it got that the railroads weren't running the passenger trains. Then you have these ridiculous prices. It used to be when I was a teenager, a penny a mile for a rail fan trip. The normal fare was two cents a mile, and west of Chicago it was one point nine cents per mile and uh, it was it were, the rail fan trips were all basically one cent a mile so you had a hundred mile 100, 200 mile trips and it cost two dollars plus you had a dining car. You always had to have a dining car on a rail fan trip. And my father used to guarantee that the ga dining car would serve so many mules. He never had to make good on a shortage because rail fans ate. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's uh, from my experience, that's quite true. They, they tend to now do a lot. They, <laughs> now they have some special train, and it's basically a dollar a mile on the, the Reading and whatever. It's, but they charge, you know, the figures out. A hundred dollar, a hundred miles on this particular. The what is it? The one that is, um, in the coal fields. Uh, the running they, they, they yeah. people who who uh, gaga paying. A, Basically, a dollar a mile with it. Well, there's a real bad trip. When I went on, it was basically one cent a mile. Well, now they have private cars and you play a special round, uh, you know, rate yeah. for that. And uh, in the event, because now it's much more, as I'm sure you're aware, that it's much more difficult to to run fan trips because of insurance and, and such, and some railroads don't yeah, want to have them. Sure. With these uh, lawsuits with ridiculous awards, I don't know what, plus uh, you're going, well I don't, I haven't been on a real fan trip since. 19, hmm. about 19, 40, 48, about 1948 was hmm. the last rail fan trip that I was 
John. But now they. It's uh, the real 71 fans, years uh, now. You know, there's so little uh, left of railroad service. Well, let me ask you this uh, how, how far west had you gone on the, the Lackawanna? Um, I'm talking about, of course, the original Lackawanna from Hoboken to. Yeah. Buffalo. How how far west were you able to go uh, on the? Oh, uh, the rail fan trips. Well, I mean, any time. I mean, did oh, you oh, when you oh, if you rode? Oh, we'd go to Buffalo and then. Oh, you've been to Buffalo. Oh, and okay. then I, would, I worked in Yellowstone. You know, when I was twenty years old. I, you know, we're, we're going back 70 years at the moment. Okay, so 1949 or thereabouts, yeah. And, uh, so I'm rather slow, plus old age. Most rail fans can't tell you much of anything. Because all they do is photograph the Amtrak train going by, or a freight train. Well, that's but that's all there is to photograph. I yeah, guess, I mean there is the local the local service is gone. Let me ask you. Let me ask you this. Uh, you, of course, this 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 video is about the New Jersey cutoff, the lack of one to cut off. Um, and you, I, I, I presume you remember f um, riding the train between Port Morris and Slateford Junction or the Water Gap. Any, anything that struck you about that? I, I think in in this in the book you you, you talk rather fondly about the yeah. Book. I is that only I did it. No other rail fan was doing it. They would get in their car and drive along and maybe take pictures. But I was, I actually did it. And uh, every Saturday, I uh, was down at the railroad waiting on the local Right. And uh, the 120 electric to New York would stop. And I'd ask, where's, where's the drill? He said, he had either seen it, so I knew it was at Morristown or maybe Mars Plains, or he didn't see it. And if he didn't see it, I knew he was up on the Greystone Branch, which was the trolley car route until it was. That was quite a, quite a hill to go up to, to Greystone. Uh, and quite a hill to come down too, but uh, about I don't know somewhere around five percent or something, which is quite a, uh, quite a hill. Yeah, it um, that hill. I don't know what the percentage grade is. Uh, there is one part of it on a curve going up, which is the steepest part. And uh, normally, if you had an extra man running the engine, uh, the fireman took over and ran that branch because he knew how you made it, where you made the run. And around this curve with a bank, the road right beside it. Um, because if you had more than two cars, if you knew what for coal, if you knew how to do it, you could take three cars of coal up to Greystone. 
But if you didn't know where, you'd stall. Because my, my wife's boss lives right near there, and uh, I, we, we go up past and you can see where the old um, trolley right away was. Uh, but uh, granted, it was also used for steam locomotives. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the Greystone branch was built for, uh, well, it's in there when the thing was built. Greystone, I've forgotten. I have to dig it out, uh, but I mean, it, it was in 1800s, late 1890 or somewhere yeah. around, around there. And it, it was electrified when the Marsh County Traction Company, about 1911, I think, ran the, the trolley wire up the Greystone branch. Okay. So you do, do you remember now? Let me see. You you were um, you were born in what? Nineteen twenty nine. Okay, so the electrification of the Morristown line. You, you would have been too young to remember that. No, I. Uh, yeah. That's all. But it was it was almost brand new though when you were growing up at that point. Because I had an no, uncle. Uh, electrified. 30 and 31. 31. Yeah. Yeah. Because I had an uncle. would go down every Saturday. Had to be with the, the local freight. And um, I'd find out from the electric where it was. And so did I have, he's coming down right after me. Which meant Ten minutes later, it'd show up, or he's up at Greystone. Didn't see him, which means he wouldn't be down until three o'clock. Hmm. So, uh, and of course, because I collected these autographs, every all the railroad. The only time I. If there was a train master around, I was a good standing way back, you know. <laughs> I'm sure the train master knew what the heck I was doing when he wasn't around. But, but th th this is this I guess says you know a lot about how railroading has changed because yes, it's tremendous. Because you, they, they would never, uh, I mean, nowadays, I don't know that the kids ever get close to the locomotives, much less get to ride in them, or were they, you know, it seems like there was I much... Rode, I rode so many engine cabs. Um, You're probably pretty jaded by now, but uh, it's still... Oh, yeah. But the local freight was, but I also would take the electric up to Dover, the 812, and then I got the train, the Washington train, to Wharton, which was two miles, and then I would walk two miles to the CNJ to visit the 060 Camelback and the 480 Camelback. So you were, you were someone who was very interested in, in steam locomotives, to say the oh, least. Oh yeah, I did. Oh, <laughs> interestingly, my first locomotive ride was in a diesel. Well, that's ironic. <laughs> it was at Kingsland, and you know, they were. It was. Number three thousand, I think, and it had to go from this track to here, but it had to go a mile to get over and then come back down. And I rode that diesel, so I also began to 
without realizing it. I talked railroaders the way they talk, which is only slightly different, but you could tell that me, it was definitely different from any other kid who was hanging around the railroad. And I, uh, with all these autographs, which are down at Strasbourg now. Did anyone ever refuse to give you an autograph, or did they all willingly say, oh, sure, kid, no problem? What, what, what was their. Uh, would most, I would think, were, were pretty open to that, or? Oh, oh I just go up and it, it, it was an extra guy, uh, not the regular, and they all, they all sign the office people, the trainmen's. Because one of the things, and it comes out, it comes out from your dad and um, and, and from yourself in, in, in the books. And you talk about the the Lackawanna men, and of course there there, there were women who worked for the Lackawanna, although they worked in yeah, offices. Yeah, they were but switchboard operators, but most of them. Um, the, the, the people who ran the trains were, were men. Um, oh yes, and you 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 referred to them um, as as being. Um, and I'm kind of paraphrasing. Um, you know, I don't want to say they were better than other railroad men, but they were of a high. Yes. Ca- oh, definitely. You, oh, you, you the would say that. The okay. men were definitely better than the Erie. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was uh, uh, and the mer- merger of the two companies. Uh, unfortunately. The Erie was the bigger company, didn't have the reputation of on-time performance. Uh, What do you make of this? Was there anything that you think, going back, um, before the merger, anything that could have prevented that from taking place? Because I think it's generally agreed that the the Lackawanna got the short end of the stick um, in many ways. And uh, we'll even talk about like uh, it was some other things about it too. That really, the the Lackawanna, the like Perry Shoemaker didn't. Yeah, he was promised right. the presidency. The, the, the originally thing, the agreement was that the president of the Erie would of the EL, but it didn't work out that way. And the company, the Erie man retired, the um, Erie man, and they were headed for bankruptcy. Um, William White was a Lackawanna president. Formerly, he wasn't at that point. He was in retirement, if I understand. No, he, uh, and he was brought in to save the EL from bankruptcy. Unfortunately, White died at his desk, having just gotten a physical and well. It, you just take it easy for a few days. He died that that day, I think. Mm. So uh, the Erie was not. Oh, I wrote the Erie. Um, various because I worked in Wellsville, which was on the Erie for four years. So what, 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 you know, when the when the merger takes place, of course, things um, the, the 
and, and actually some things had already taken place before the merger. For example, some of the uh, oh, the yeah. Lackawanna lines had been um, severed uh, because there was duplication yeah, right, right. up in New York That's State. Jumping. But when we when we get to the the, the early years, and um, you this is covered in the book as well about um, Garrett Mountain and Patterson, where the the boom yeah. line is severed there, and um, the the yeah, the highway the, department. The Erie uh, was the Erie management, and they was the Lackawanna line. The Lackawanna train master or superintendent who was at the hearing said, Tom, you're entirely right, but we couldn't say a thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. But everything you said about the line being closed uh, and using the area was unnecessary. Because that, that, that really changes things. And yeah, so. it, uh, and when, when White He died. The uh, the Erie he got on him to bankruptcy, I think. That's when Derrico comes in later on, and yeah. uh, uh -huh. Norfolk and Western, and, and, and so oh, forth. Oh, there's that old mesh. Did you ever get to ride the, uh, because you, you talk about riding up to, to Buffalo, did you ever get to ride the, because uh, you had the, what, the nickel plate had a relationship with the Lackawanna? Um, no, I... You never went beyond I, there? I, I never rode on the Lackawanna in the cab, except to... Uh, Binghamton, and I think I rode up to uh, Cortland or, or the um, their line on up to uh, Oswego. And I used to so did you ride in coach? I mean, if you weren't riding in the cab, or <laughs> well, one time. How was that? Yeah, I I only went to up west of Scranton uh, once or twice. So you got to go over the Tunkhannock Viaduct, of course. So, of course. Train master was around, floating around. <laughs> what, what, I, what was the train master's? What was his job? To, to supervise or? A uh, train master, Andy Hopper was one, and um, he was a roving foreman. So it was like a supervisor. More or less. Well, yes. And I mean, the master, you had. What's he looking for? You know, uh, what is violations? What's what's his? Oh, kind just of keeping an eye on things. That are only a couple of times did I ever see him, hmm. but he was known to be floating around Dover. Um, I didn't ride in the cab with the uh, engine. Okay, so they, they would enforce that. No, uh, but I'm sure the train master knew that when I he <laughs> wasn't there where I was. And I learned how to fire the lousy Lackawanna coal. Boy, it was terrible. 
you had um, 80,000 BTUs per ton or whatever, uh, whereas normal soft coal is, is 12,000 BTUs. A lot go on is coal, but I never knew that. Uh, so I knew they have no. lousy coal, huh. and I, I mean, you know, I was uh, a junior in high school, and I ran a s samples in chemistry lab of, and proved it. <laughs> he had it um, only black on it that they got from up around Wayland. Uh, and when I got up to Canada to help win the Korean War, because I was needed, they drafted me, the Canadian National had good coal. And boy, was what a difference to make. It, shovel that coal. Um, I remember my final trip out of the Pa down to Hudson Bay Junction. It was uh, 90 miles of freight. And the diesel was in the Comcast says was a hospital, hospital car we Others tested. I, I was on the locomotive. There were two of us assigned to the locomotive, and four of us assigned to the hospital car. And the other fellow had no interest in being in the diesel. So I was, and I learned how to. I qualified as a locomotive engineer in the Canadian National. I have the certificate from the superintendent. He gave it to me when I, at the end, we were coming back to the U.S. So I it, used it, to run. It, could you have gone back to, to run this? Uh, no, I, Cause I and I help. Oh, what they had just had steam engines up there, and we, when we had the diesel, I point out to the engineer who had never run a diesel certain things. Started a diesel train. You would put it in the first notch, and the second notch, third notch, and you got it eventually to the eighth notch. And uh, I knew all the black qualified. <laughs> I also got a stuck once <laughs> coming into Gillum. I'm afraid. <laughs> we, uh, I was running it and it had uh, a couple of inches of snow over the top of the rail. And when you have that, sand doesn't work. Up to there, so if you had a heavy train, which we only had once, or ten, uh, you cut the the rest of the train off, which was about three thousand tons, and you ran over the rail 
to clean off the rails so you could then use sand on the rail for negotiating the six tenth of one percent grade up into Gillon. And I got it stuck because I the diesel started to slip and I shut the throttle back, which was the wrong thing to do. The next we went another quarter mile or less and she started to slip again. I shut it down again, that mistake. I never did it again. So, but, uh, oh, I, I was running the, the freight. It was night time. Doing it, we're going to Gillum, and uh, we didn't have a speedometer in the diesel, but we did have an ammeter, and I knew that in a steady state condition, an ammeter that showed say 800 amps was. 30 miles an hour, which was the speed limit for the freight. And this is nighttime. We got up to Gillum, and the conductor, he didn't know I was running it. We had bay windows. He got up to the cab, he said, well, good run. I don't have to fake our arrival time at Gillum, right smack on the mo minute for the 30 mile an hour speed for the 185 miles. And I, he didn't know I was running it, but I felt rudder into Gillum, right smack on the advertised. To fake because it was night time and he could fudge what time they arrived. So they, uh, uh, they didn't exceed the speed limit. And, uh, so um, it, you also talk in your books about um, sometimes where trains had to make up time. Um, Yes. Uh, oh, how? you had. Um, if, ah. if they're running late, of course, and and the uh, there's no train master or somebody else. Uh, oh so, yeah. You, that you might uh, uh, oh. exceed the, the 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 speed limits. Any, any any stories about that or? We started out of the pond with the diesel, and the road foreman engines was uh, running the diesel and the speed limit was 35 miles an hour for a passenger train and we were an hour or two hours late. The first thing he did was to ignore the speed limit and we <laughs> proceeded to Wobodin at uh, about 45 miles an hour. Crack was good shape. We knew where the bad spots were and slow down. In fact, there's a sample of different sections of coal. The uh, one on the right is 170. 130 pounds. Uh, the rail on the left is a, a U rail, uh, 
thirty pounds. And uh, well, they use you. I, I, I was. I talked. I remember they invited me to go down. I used to meet them, and then when they went to Chatham, I got off, and uh, I closed the switch, and then I went home. And this one time, the conductor said, would you like to go down to Chatham and back? And they turned it. That's it. You were so right. And so we're down at Chatham and doing the two brakemen go down in the hole there. And the conductor is doing paperwork and I'm just standing around in the caboose. And that didn't intrigue me. So I asked the conductor, you got any water? Yeah. You got on at me? He had that. And so I washed the caboose windows. That was the right thing to do. Of course, the, the two brakemen came back and the caboose windows were there for the first time in probably six years had been washed. If I ever I did something right, it was do that. Well, that word got around Port Morris, I guess. that the caboose windows got washed and I had done it. I had another time in the shop I was a special apprentice which was an obsolete program at that time because diesel and uh, I'm not doing anything in the special apprentice room. And a guy comes from the other end of the shop and say, Hey, I need you. Okay. So I followed him. We went up to the other end of the shop where 4664 was in. And they had to take the, the nuts, two inch nuts, off the bearings. And said, he said, now, these nuts, some of them may be greasy, but others may be dry. In which case, they didn't make a mess of you. I think they were always greasy. He just told me that some of them are. And so I went down under the air, <laughs> removed the 16 two inch bolts, nuts. And uh, I noticed towards the end of it. I wasn't being able to see very well. It was, and I got out. That's because of the grease. I couldn't see. Flung off, and my face, and my overalls, and uh, I came out from underneath. There were three guys standing close by, wondering, probably, how's this Joe College kid going to do when he discovers he's a mess? Well, 
I came out from under and discovered the reason I was having difficulty seeing when my goggles were covered with grease. And I, my first words to those three guys were, boy am I a mess, and I laugh. And that got me in with the shop. Everybody knew that I was different from the other special apprentices because I laughed when I was a mess, and I was a mess. I came, uh, as I was riding the Lackawanna from Scranton to Denville, Forty-four no. and it was a rainy. The airport was shut down because of the. This is 1945. The airport wreck, Scranton, and I got got off the electric. I noticed I was we got on the electric at Dover and, I, and there were only one or two people on the train at that time and I, at the start. And I noticed that the ticket collector looked at me, he looked at me sort of funny. Yeah, I found out what it was when I got home, looked in the mirror, and my face was completely covered with smoke, except for the goggles. And with them taken off, we had two round, clean stretches, a white shirt that was spotless. <laughs> they are uh, because I had tucked in a bandana around the neck because of this. Now, uh, if you see photos from back in the day, and you, um, it was not unusual for a uh, an engineer. I'm not sure about firemen, but engineers to to wear a tie. Um, that right in passenger service. It, well, it was in or passenger. in freight service. The tie was pre tied. Um, you know, in so they didn't actually tie service, it, they just clipped it on or you something. Had, um, you had clip on, and uh, you no, know, after the diesels came, the ties disappeared. Really? Like Johnny mm -hmm. Vaughn. There are pictures you'll see of uh, Danny Vaughn? Johnny Vaughn was. Johnny Vaughn? Uh, Vaughn. Yeah. Danny and Johnny, they were brothers. And oh. then there was a third brother who was just, he preferred not to uh, just stay in the yard. And a switch engine. Um, but now those are, they were a great time for me. I had it made and I knew it. When I, uh, Drafted to win the Korean War. They put me exactly in the U.S. Army, exactly in the one job I was 
most ideally suited for. Can you imagine Korean War and I had the best appointment. It was testing diesel locomotive. And we went up to Canada. And I had it. And also, I got $10 a day back then, which would be about $80 now, uh, per diem that I was away from the army base. It's a pa, a church, you know. And I'm making $10 a day per diem my expenses were two dollars a day. I was netting eight dollars um, every day. Eight and a half dollars, rather, because Saturday was a half a day. And, uh, and of course, I spoke the language of the railroaders whereas the others didn't. So the, the Canadian railroaders and the American railroaders kind of spoke a common language, if you will? No, so, it's it just the Canadian. Was it, there were the six of us PFCs. And, uh, Private first class? Yeah, uh, we're in Canada. I had the four of them were assigned to the hospital car and were doing things mostly at Churchill. Northern That's way up there, Churchill. Yeah, yeah it's a bay. Yeah. But, uh, That's not a place you want to be in January, I don't think. <laughs> uh, were you up there that during the during the winter time? Got up there at Thanksgiving and left on April 26th. Oh, so you spent the winter there. And uh, the coldest, it was a warm winter. The coldest days were only, uh, I think it was 30 degrees minus wouldn't chill. You never gave the temperature you went by the wind chill, which is a combination of the breeze coming off of Hudson Bay and uh, the temperature of the, of the thermometer of chill. So railroad equipment. And I've got all that written down. That whole, my whole thing in Canada is all written down uh, in my biography. Uh, I wrote everything down, all the unique things I did. Um, my brother was a town historian from Madison designated by the borough. When he died, he hadn't written a single thing down. I had 60,000 words. Um, everything that he knew about Madison died when he had his stroke. And he was 80. So, so I take it you learned that it's important to write stuff down. Very few do. Um, and I, I wrote all my, my railroad experiences up in Canada. In the 
U.S. too, because I was in for two years, plus leap year day, and they didn't pay extra for it. Not that many, but um, I had it made. I figured I was making as much money probably as a finance captain was being paid at Churchill. And I, after I got out of the Army, my father told me to put my savings, which amounted to eight and a half dollars a day, plus the PFC's pay, plus being out of the country. That second year of winning the Korean War, and I was needed, you know, enlisted. You didn't know whether they took you out of sympathy or whether, but if you were drafted, you knew that you were needed. And uh, it was the most, my second year in the Army was the most enjoyable year of my life before or after. Um, the, when I was a PFC, oh, they, they promoted me to corporal and um, that meant you had to have put corporal stripe on. So, I got a two coats of cement and I glued them on, on one shirt and one ice jacket and one so forth. But I, I was in Denver, I was in Chicago for 14 weeks. I was in Washington, D.C. Um, research. And, uh, I, it was a wonderful, and I got it all recorded. So, recorded. so after the yeah, war, well, it's down at Strasbourg. But no other young guy, all these, you see him standing beside the track, the train goes by, taking a picture, taking a picture of uh, oh, shit. So there, your, your no, cat? No, there's a cat. What's your cat's name? Tiger. Tiger, okay. He's been underneath here, listening. So I, I finally you, got tired of listening and decided you were harmless. <laughs> so he came out. You know. So you uh, you develop a, a relationship with the Strasbourg Museum at some point then, um, because well, you, my father's collection went to Strasbourg, and George Hart was headed it, and he was a real fan. He also owned the locomotive too, right? Yeah. And uh, so, but I, that two years was a tremendous, I just had it made. And I invested eight dollars and fifty cents plus my PFC pay plus my uh, being out of the country ten percent saved it all invested it and uh, up in Canada where we were. International Nickel 
was sniffing around up there of nickel. And I knew that. It hadn't reached. And so I bought international nickel when I got out. And it, within two years or something like that, it had increased five times what I had paid for it. Yeah, that was a pretty good investment then. Yes. And uh, there were some other things. I knew the Union Pacific oh, um, had acquired a lot of CNNW uh, stock to bought but couldn't vote it. And one I noticed in the Wall Street Journal, a little item like that, said the Union Pacific, and the government had authorized the Union Pacific, they can, can now vote that CNNW stock. So I bought all I could buy, 400 shares, I guess, and bought it. It jumped from $20 a share to 40, about 47, I think, just in effect overnight. I really made it out. I made it out on the Virginia Railway because I knew their price was depressed. I did not buy and sell. I bought out. Although I did. I did an experiment once. I bought five good speculative stocks and compared with another thing and discovered that the speculative stocks didn't do any better than the solid solid stock and uh, but I didn't have to send, spend sales commission to buy so some of it was savvy some of it Percentage dollar value was yellow. I lost $1,900. But percentage of my losses, very little. So you invested primarily in railroad stock, is what no, you said? No. 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 Uh -uh. No. No. So you uh, a blue chip? Yeah, basically, uh, Johnson and Johnson, 3M, a solid stocks, which I intended to keep until I died. But I made a considerable amount of money in the stock market. That's where I made it thanks to what I bought, whereas the others getting a hot tip is going up. They might buy it, tell me it goes up a couple of bucks and they sell.
15 years, I imagine. I've only ridden on two Amtrak trains that were late, in which the engineer tried to make up lost time. Only two out of all the Amtrak trains between New Jersey and Chicago. So, only two, and uh, the, uh, we were way late because of a derailment, and I noticed the, the poles in Lancaster area were going about by pretty fast. Got my watch out. We were doing 90 miles an hour, and the speed limit was 79. We're doing 90. And I go up to the hunt the conductor and the brakeman who are eating their lunch, and I said, "Boy." It's nice to have an engineer who is concerned with making up lost time. Oh yes, that's right, 79 miles an hour. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, I turned to him and I said, yeah, I guess 40 seconds a mile is 79, no, 90. <laughs> they didn't know who I was, but I got to remember. Yeah, it's um, 79, yeah. And we made up a half an hour. But then the next engineer took over and he didn't make up any time for 200 miles. You talk about it in the book about um, riding the MUs and where the um uh, talk about making up time where um, the, if you rode um, from Roseville Avenue to, to Orange and, and didn't shut off, yeah. that you would pick up additional speed as you're going downhill from there, like through South Orange, Maplewood. Yeah, and we, such. we went through Maplewood Station at 78 miles an hour. Zoom! If we didn't shut off for um, in um, Orange Curve, and I figured with the engineer who I knew that he couldn't possibly uh, go faster than the speed limit on that curve of. Uh, 80, uh, seven, uh, 50 miles an hour. I told them, no way you can do that. They all shut off for the orange curve. And he said, well, next time I won't. He did. And uh, he was the only engineer who did not shut off for orange curve. We went 76 to 78 miles an hour through uh, Maplewood. Yeah, I think that's like you're all that when fast. I, when I was commuting to college, and uh, but I am correct. Well, we uh, up in Canada. Eighty-pound rail. They ran sixty miles an hour on eighty-pound rail. That's pretty. Uh, that's pretty fast. Uh, eighty-pound kind of rail. No. So. 
Oh, and then, you know, when the government Amtrak took over the railroads, the Union Pacific reduced their speed limit from 90 to 70. To 70, right? Two hundred miles. We were three hours late at the start, and we were three hours late. Two hundred miles further than Sacramento. The pride, which it disappeared. Oh. There's a book, Engineer, My Life on the Locomotive, which he uh, starts as a hires out. They had a pride, and this is back in the steam days, in being on time, and all disappeared. Time you never made it up, and it's still that way because of, uh, at least it's not quite as bad, I think, but I don't know. I have written. Well, I guess the insurance and such you know, prevents them from exceeding, and now they also have uh, speed recorders, so. Oh, if well, you exceed the speed limit, you're going to get yourself in trouble. You're probably fired. The passenger trains, all 97 percent on time, but you you ran it 79 or 80 miles an hour. You didn't run it 70 miles an hour. Prior in management. And uh, Johnny Vaughan, a good friend of my father and me, we went across the cutoff with 44. Sixty miles an hour. We went over twenty-nine miles. We went across the cutoff in twenty-nine minutes. That was seven, eight miles an hour faster than number six, Phoebe Snow. Of course, the Phoebe Snow had to stop at Blair's Town, but. Yeah. You didn't stop, right? You went all the way through. Yeah. Well, no. We, um, you know. Or did you have to slow down for the hell or something? The 44 is a milk train, was it not? But it's. No, the um, railroads. going to go to Washington up to Harrisburg you go to Washington and go up to Philadelphia and then take the train to Harrisburg and so I asked for a ticket Washington to Harrisburg he only gave me a ticket to Philadelphia. He said, the train sold out. I said, no, he said, it may sell out out of Philadelphia going to New York. But he didn't. And then another person, they said, no, they've got plenty of seats. But I'm not that guy. The 
ticket counter said the train sold out only from Philadelphia to New York. And now they're going to run a non-stop Amtrak from Washington up to Newark. And, uh, whereas England, they're going to do it in two and a half hours. 200 miles. Just one trip each way a day. In the morning going north, I guess coming south. Uh, I, in, in Europe, the French run, in Germany, they run their trains at 180, 190 miles an hour. In the U.S., only two and a half hours more, 220 more mile trip because of the And of course, the rail fans are there. I don't know how many there are. I know the RLHS has dropped significantly. NRHS has dropped even worse because the, the railroads have so little. It's unique for them anymore. My goodness. Well, the railroads, I think, have dropped from the, the, they're not as cool as they used to be. They don't, um, they're not as interesting, I think, as in, in no. some ways. Uh, I mean, to your point about that the, there is a lack of variety, but also I think there are just so many other things that um, may interest, um, I'll say, younger folks that yes, it's so just not, it hasn't caught on well, as a hobby. We have, we have that. Um, English Model Railroad Store, which is one of the 20 biggest stores, or Model Railroad, and they say they're the people who come in that store now are almost all of 40, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. It says the young people are going for iPads and so forth. And he says, it's just, I, he thinks about 20 years from now, there'll be far less and I couldn't believe it. There's more because the railroads, LCL freight, so forth and so on. Well, there are not as many people who are employed by the railroads. The railroads do, uh, they, they work very hard to almost like stay invisible. Um, and it, uh, it, it just changed so much because it's the railroad used to be the center of a town. That's right. And it's that's not that's the case not, anymore. No, that's, been that's right. The um, no, it's inevitable. Um, you now, now if, if there is a center, they're not. There's you can't. So they have their a rail fan trip. They want a dollar a mile. We wrote them a penny a mile 60 years ago. Uh, it's, it's a big difference. It's just change. And the RLHS is uh, they don't have the brains and the intelligence, which is not interesting in railroads. 
Now, there is one era, one phase of railroading which is being ignored by the RLHS and um, it's the one area you have growth potential be hard to do and that is the county historical societies of which there are 2,700 in the United States, I think it is. Uh, those people are interested in the old things and what they need to do is some way or other get members of these, have each of these county historical societies have a member who uh, realizes what the railroads were like and now, and, but the RLHS is only interested in Denver Union station collapse. Recent things they're not interested in. So, so well, that gives you a little, as I said, once you get me going, will we <laughs> ever stop? No, stay here. Well, the clock, as far as I'm concerned. Well, we've, we've covered a lot of, a lot of territory, literally. Um, so I certainly want to appreciate your, your time and... Um, uh, no, I, I got lots of time. <laughs> I got plenty of nothing, and nothing's good for me. I got my one. I got my thing. I went to I also appreciate the, the work you've done in the past. Uh, the, the, the books on the lack one, I realized that if it had not been for you, even though your dad had put together, you, it, they would never have been published without you. Um, uh, the is first that true? Two would have, I think, but not the third one. And uh, the certificate of book award is up there. Uh huh. For, up on top there, the uh, Tom Tabor Express. I wanted to ask you about the Tom Tabor Express. I didn't realize that there was a, now you uh, pointed it out. Yes. Uh, what's what's the, the history behind that? Because that, that was named after your dad. Yes, yeah. yeah it's there, and the sign is there on the front of at Denville. And that's the award that the RNLHS gave for the book award. And this here describes why and shows the train in a time, the, the Tom Tabor Express, which was carried the name for about 20 years, which is strong enough. To, uh, and uh, three of them. I have my award is a, a wooden plaque Behind you, I got, my father got several awards over the years. Um, yeah, you, you, he, you pretty he much covered along, this. He got answer. along with railroaders, and so do I. Uh, but the politicians, yeah, that Andover, fiasco. It's ten years now and they still haven't built the thing. And furthermore, I'm against it. It's just going to be a pork thing. Just if they ever do it. Um, 
they no I I have I had six bookcases of books and file cabinets on railroad research and now I've narrowed it down to just the fish is usually here and out the hallway. And, um, How many books did you did you write? You have your author. Thirty. Thirty. Hmm. You know, I have it listed. All of, there are booklets. A lot of uh, Winsport North Branch. And, Oh, Rockaway Valley yeah, Railroad, right. yeah, that one. Morristown and Erie. Yes, right. yeah, so Morristown and Erie. No. Yes. forgot about that one. No. I used to go use my bike. I, I used to, all right, I went out of my house on my bike down to Summit, five miles. Put it on a train going to Gladstone, 22 miles, and then there took it off, and I biked the 12 or 13 miles to White House, and then I put it on a Jersey Central train coming from Peabody. to uh, Elizabeth, got off at Elizabeth and biked the 13 miles home. And that was one. And I, and That's I'm quite a bit of exercise. So far behind, but Italy and France Germany have been doing their uh, and their whole thing from LA up to San Francisco which is or and over to like a bad car. It's a different era. It's your uh, I remember someone said about this, not, not necessarily about these projects, but in general, that it used to be that you were rewarded for, for building things. Now you're rewarded for stopping things. And that's, that's the problem. That's, it, uh, we've gone the opposite extreme from building to basically not build, or making it very difficult to, to build. It takes all the initiative out of
computers and everything is up. iPad. I don't have any of that. So I guess those are the. Live another year anyway. So I'm supposed to be able to live possibly as much as reaching even 100. someplace where it won't be broken up be permanent. And uh, when I moved in here, they were delighted to have these pictures in there. Um, and out in the hallway. Yeah, we, we were shown that on the way in. That, uh, uh, it's like an art ga or, or gallery, I guess you could say. Picture yeah. gallery. They'll have a sign sometime or other. But, um, no. Now, if you're like me, you'll go home and your mind will continue to function and you'll want to come back to investigate whatever or so forth. You're perfectly welcome. But I don't have it. Okay. There, there, my, and their clothes and um, clothes there. Uh, I've got a CDs, but I don't have it. I did away with my computer.
times they weren't using me. There was a period, oh, it's about 20 years ago, when I advertised my willingness to help. And I did not put it in these rail fan publications. And uh, in six years, I had 1,600 letters sent to me. Four years, I exceeded 300 a year people wanting information. That is now diminished down to practically nothing. The rail bands are not. The, the general public doesn't have an interest in the railroads anymore. Um, well, what, one of the things I wanted to do with this particular video was to introduce another generation or maybe two generations to to Tom Tabor. Granted there's a, a couple of generations who were familiar with your work, uh, especially those people who were familiar with the Lackawanna, but uh, I know I've talked to, to younger folks and they didn't recognize your name. I was very surprised and um, yeah. I'm hoping that this will change that. I know. No, I have two uh, cards I got saying I'm the number one railroad historian in the United States because I have so much material, but I don't have a lot of it. I don't. But Anyway, you're number one, and people don't know because they don't, they, first off, they're only interested in the last 50 years, typical rail fan is not interested in 1905 or 1888, expected. In, uh, in, the 19, in the 1880s, the rail fans were interested in the 1830s. The locomotive builders, uh, which they were a slew of. But after about 60 years, the interest diminishes and has diminished going way, way back. So it's not, this isn't a new, th a new thing. It's merely a continuation. Oh, it may also be a... Uh, do the, doing research and uh, I have in my volumes. I'm doing research. Um, I tell how I researched a short line, a medium-sized railroad, and a large railroad. And then I said, besides that, there are the following um, the courthouse bankruptcies, receiverships, uh, and things, if you're interested, you don't know it. And uh, as uh, I recently, about well, a year ago, discovered when the last narrow gauge railroad was incorporated, was built, and operated, and about when it closed, um, the last one, and uh, that Hanson, he's 
said their Washington Union Station, they got a lot of, which is relatively recent, they got a lot of letters and so on. Uh, it's to be expected. It's only 70 years ago. But a good reference library has, and I've been in a lot of them. Uh, I tell you where to look besides the places that I list. I think to your point about the, the, the fact that interest seems to wane after, let's say, a half century or a little bit more, is that after half a century, uh, there are fewer and fewer people who are yes. there to tell the story. Oh, no, this is perfectly yeah. normal. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it was in the 1880s. 80s, 50 years was 1830. You think of 1880 being ancient, well that's just the equivalent of 50 years ago. You know. 1830 though, you're talking about the very beginnings of uh, railroading. I mean it was totally different <laughs> to ride a train in 1830. Oh, there, there's nowhere <laughs> totally near 90% of what made interesting railroads aren't anymore. They've discontinued it. LCL freight, uh, branch line operations have gone, uh, local freights. And it's to be expected. Mm. And if somebody, um, but very few have an interest. I wrote a book on railroads that were built prior to the Civil War. That's 1880. Um, no, 1860. Which, um, I did a thing. There's 800 were built. That's in the U.S. alone. 1800, 1880. Is that the U.S. alone? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, no, I, it's all up here. But, many of those but I have it all written down, except nobody can understand it. Um, I asked the RNLHS that they should have somebody understudy me. No interest. Mm. I gave them a lot of old material, um, 1880s, so forth, that was, I've reproduced on better paper, and uh, no interest, they've never published any of it, because they're not interested. They're interested in that three mile train, and uh, that the Amtrak train made up. It's to be expected. It's the way it was back then. Interesting. Nothing. Hmm. And so I have this last, and as Hansen wrote to me, you know, you talk about the last narrow gauge, we don't get any letters about it, but we got lots of letters on the Washington Union Station. Sure, we expect. But of course, if they if you, they saw an article on something which is relatively obscure, it's quite possible they might get letters on that because people didn't even know about it. If they don't know about it, how are they going to write about it? I mean, that's, that's sort of right. like a, it's a, if you're a historical 
trouble with the RLHS, they're a social society, mm -hmm. uh, primarily now. And they don't, I don't even believe they have a minimum number you to form a chapter. It used to be that it was. It used to be a, you had to have at least 20 or whatever. And as far as I know, Tulsa, or you got a bunch of guys who were interested only in the social aspects of their, but not the historical aspects of which go back. So, mm. but it's all in print. Um, I don't know. I heaved out a dumpster load of reference books because no interest to speak of. I do have, I think, a set of all the books that I wrote still in my house in the Tabor uh, section of books that deal with Tabor. So, partners. Now, in your movies, Columbia, if you are sharp looking, you'll see two places around Columbia where the train room threw off a newspaper to a person standing in their backyard. To what they threw every day. They picked up a newspaper out of the and threw it off. I, I had a neighbor, Max, her neighbor was a, uh, a retired conductor on the Lackawanna and he used to get a paper every every day, but the, it, it ended up in different places, so he had devised this stick which had a, a nail on the end of it and he would reach over the, uh, the, the, the fence towards the tracks and he had to spear it. It was, a, depending on where it landed, some places it was, mm -hmm. it, it came right against the fence, sometimes it was pretty close to the tracks and he would spear it and that would be, he'd get, uh, well, I guess it would have been the milk news or whatever he got in those days, but uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that would be, he got it every yeah, single the, day. Um, you had the, the branch up to the mine, which was shut down in the war and then it reopened. You coming from Washington. I don't know if I don't know whether it's that branch went off at Columbia. It, it came up and pushed the cars, the empties, up this spur. I imagine it's been torn up. Okay. I don't know if any... It was a half mile long, and you had, of course, Greystone Branch. No, I, no. I started... Five years old when I took my first, I was six years old, first engine picture with my father with a baby brownie at Dover. I have the negative still of the camel back. So, but I'm delighted. Anybody who's interested, we could.
because you don't think. I used to, when I hit a jackpot, a person who could ramble, I invariably had to recontact them on additional things. And that one fellow is 20,000 words, another 20,000 words, and another 20,000, 60,000 words he typed up for me. And they're all recorded at Strasbourg. Are you still typing on your typewriter? I mean, are you, do you still use that or? Oh, yes. You do? Okay. That's the only thing I have. That's the only thing you have, okay. That's, um, and the ribbon is, uh, I should, I should try and get a, another ribbon. I've got a letter there. I mailed three letters out yesterday. I've got to write my son and see if he's, he's not going to find what I want because he doesn't follow or have any interest in my things. He's interested in his things, but he has no interest. Whereas I had tremendous interest in my father's stuff. Spent a week just organizing it. When he, uh, after he died, now for, but I don't know the the reference books I did. What I have, I know there are eight. There are about eight volumes. Or one number one is deals with names of any anything by index, railroads, builders. Number two is what I got from about 80 newspapers, magazines, and it has thousands and thousands the, um, dealing with the subject. Pennsylvania Railroad, it has all the things I found on the Pennsylvania Railroad, or it's all, it's all, but I, I have disposed of, but it's all supposedly, hopefully, down in Strasburg, where they, use this stuff regularly, the reference material, but I don't have it anymore. I got rid of it. Mm. But I did keep the pictures. And you never saw a house in which all the dogs, from the time I was six years old, are memorialized here, seven of them. Now I have a cat because when you go in the hospital, uh, you can put out a, a week's food and the cat will take a week to eat it. A dog will eat a week's food in one day. <laughs> so Don't we know that? exactly practical. <laughs> Yeah, that's the way dogs are, I'm afraid. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so that's why I have a cat, because he, um, he nibbles. He's eight years old. And I, I remember this 
starting that. And I continued it until I was about 80. And then I got rid of a whole lot of stuff. I don't know if they put it up for auction. I don't know what they do with it. Oh, I know that's it. But I did keep all the pictures. And uh, there are 50 some pictures in the, the hallway. And this, and there's um, 10 more pictures, but I don't know where they are. If I find them, I'll duplicate them, enlarge them, mat them, frame them, and hang them. They're all color of the 1850s, 60s, 70s. You see all these here. Scranton. Scranton. Yeah. Our backyard in Madison. That's the crew, one of the two crews who I grew up with. I'm the person at the left, and that's two weeks before I graduated from engineering college as an industrial as an engineer. So I celebrated it by him going with my friends that day. There, of course, her long since died. The picture of this steam engine breaking on the, as well as from New York, which is where I worked for five years, which was a couple of years So I've given you a bunch of, a lot of just information. meanderings. <laughs> Me yeah, he, he sure did meander. I wish he shut up about her. Well, I, I, I appreciate that you've, you've meandered quite a f through quite a few subjects. Um, I have a huge Supposedly, I have everything at Strasbourg um, because I got any reference. I made three copies of it. One here, which I've disposed of. One at Strasbourg. I think the other one is out in Sacramento. So if we because if you find those, there's these other locations that so, so if we went to Strasbourg, what would we find of yours? Hmm? If we went to the Strasbourg, you know, to the the museum, the Pennsylvania Museum of Strasbourg, what would we find of yours there? Is it is it a four headlights, six bells. Lanterns, sixteen file cabinets. So the records dealing there. with railroads. Okay. I have organized by books that are reference type versus just social histories. You have to go down and see. I haven't been there in a long time. And um, I would like to see in Shepherd 
museums. I would like to see them all combined into one. And, uh, but it will never happen. One was created by Pendot. One was created by me. And one was created by It's there, and I, I know how much it will cost to combine this stuff, but they're not interested. They think they, most people only see to the front of their nose. And uh, for me, I'm thinking 20 years from now, my son did things he should never have done because he wasn't thinking ahead, way ahead. So, but the duplicate that copy, if it is down at Strasburg, and I haven't been there, there in years, I, to see just what they do have online, I know that there's probably problem on my computer I have to eliminate duplicates to take up space. Just like they do in a, in a file cabinet. They yeah. take up space on a computer. I have I had it all. But there's very little interest. It's far a, a small fraction of what it was twenty years ago, I think. I don't know, I haven't been down there to see just what they do have. They, they may have, it depends how they have it organized. Well, at some point maybe we'll try to take a trip out there. Uh, so we're about to run out of, it's literally run out, okay, so. Well, I guess we're gonna have to wrap it up because we just, we, is the battery basically? Yeah, the battery's running out. So, huh. that uh, that's uh, that means it's uh, showtime's over. So, uh, well, uh, once again, I'd like to I'd like to thank you very much for for all your time, your effort in the past with all the books well, and the movies. I have on CDs the movies, eight cans. There were somebody's back's trunk out of sight because they're not here. But I took them to the railroad, New England, uh, Colorado. Those. California, I mean, Get the those. California area. Converted to digital. My father took the two foot gauge railroads in the 1930s. It was up there. And I also have them as a CD, which takes up a lot of space. 
Lauren Hatch group. So let's see what's what. Because I've been out of it now. Sixty years. So that's uh, the end of part 22 on the Lackawanna Cutoff. Hope you look forward to part 23 on the Lackawanna Cutoff.